Hello and welcome to the uh, O'Hara Training Academy Online presented by Gals Guide. I am Dr. Leah Leach. I am the headmistress of the O'Hara Training Academy and the founder of Gals Guide. So for this class, we are going to learn about three remarkable women who allowed us to soar to great heights. We are also going to sprinkle in a few other hidden figures that are not known necessarily as the famous three. I picked today of all days to talk about the hidden figures because today is Juneteenth. Juneteenth is the day of celebration of the ending of slavery. It is a day to celebrate the education and achievement of African Americans. And the hidden figures gals are just one of the many shining examples that allow us to showcase and to celebrate. So if you have uh, seen the movie or read the book, so this is the poster art for the movie. This is the book by Margot Lee Shetterly. There is also a young adult version of the book as well. And there is relatively new uh, Katherine Johnson's biography. Um, all of these are available at the Gals Guide Library. So we're super stoked about that. Uh, there are also um, a series of children's picture books that are coming out about Catherine as well. I know there are, there's one out now and I know there is more that are coming out as well. Um, Catherine, Dorothy, and Mary are the three gals that we're going to kind of use as an example of the stories, but no, for each of them, there are many, many more. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to dig in a little deeper than the movie, and I'm not going to dig in as deep as the books, okay? So you're kind of going to get a middle ground here today. Um, I'm going to lay the foundation as well as we are going to be talking about early, early days of NASA and how NASA got started because these gals made their way to the West Area computers in the very early days, and then they made it into history. And there is glorious slides, so you can see their faces. And also, uh, I have pictures of some of their work areas as well. So I'm going to put it on share screen. And dun, dun, dun. I'm gonna put it on to present. There we go, so the glorious hidden Figures. Dun, dun, dun. Let's get started with how NASA got started, okay? So NASA actually started as NACA, N-A-C-A, -A, in 1915. NACA stands for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It was a federal agency uh, to study and approve airplanes because the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, was worried about our eventual involvement in World War I. He wanted our planes to be as top-notch as possible. When the U.S. decided to enter World War II in 1942, the president at that time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, issued Executive Order 8802 and 9348, which desegregated the defense industry, and it opened hiring to Black Americans. So once again, a president in wartime thought it would be our air battles that would make a difference. Because of this executive order, the NACA started hiring. Now, many of our able boys were serving during the war effort, so it was very crucial to hire women. There were women already at the NACA headquarters in Langley Air Force Base in Virginia uh, for about a decade. But the executive order in the desegregating hiring, there was a slight problem because Virginia, as a state, was still segregated. So the West area was created and began hiring. So let's start with the first of our gals to be hired. It was Dorothy Vaughn. If you have seen the movie, she is played by Octavia Spencer. I have both. That way, you know the real life gal, <laughs> as well as the movie actress that plays her. Uh, Dorothy was a trailblazer in many ways. She was also a very fierce protector. 
Dorothy would become the first black supervisor at NASA. She would also teach herself a computer language that only a handful of people in the entire world actually knew existed. So how did she get there? Let's back up and talk about her early life, okay? So born in 1910, in Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, Dorothy's mother had died when she was just two years old. Unlike Cinderella and a horrible tale of stepmothers, Dorothy's stepmother saw how bright she was and taught her to read and write so early that she actually was placed ahead two grades when she entered school. When Dorothy was eight years old, her family moved to West Virginia because her father became the first successful black man to own a restaurant in the area. Dorothy continued to advance in school and when she graduated high school, she was 14 years old. She was super smart. She got a full scholarship to a private college for African Americans in Ohio. It's called Wilberforce University. And this meant she was away from her family, but she had a wonderful opportunity to expand her schooling. And she was 14 <laughs> going to college away from her family. When Dorothy graduated, the Great Depression hit. And everyone, including her parents, absolutely struggled to find work. She stayed close to home and she took a job as a teacher. A teacher was a very steady job. It was the steadiest job you could hope to find. Um, and even though she was 19, she felt a great responsibility to help her family and even help her sister go to college. But it, it was a struggle. Uh, she taught at an all black school, but after a while that school just shut its doors and disappeared. Uh, Dorothy started working at another school, but that school ran out of money and just stopped paying her. So while a teaching job in a nearby town, uh, she met her future husband, Howard S. Vaughn Jr., and they married in 1932 and had six children together. Dorothy spotted two different hiring notices at the post office in 1943. One was for a laundry job. Let me see, there we go. One was for a laundry job and one was for another teaching job that she could do that paid a little bit more that she could do part time, okay? But then there was this other bulletin. There was a bulletin that was for mathematics and it was an aeronautics laboratory. She decided to apply for all of them. Uh, she got offered all of the jobs, but one of them would change her future forever. So Dorothy was hired as a mathematician, grade P1, later that year. It was listed as a temporary job for the duration of the war. It would turn into a 28-year career. Her first job was for calculating and rechecking math of any of the NACA divisions. So basically rechecking math. The work was six days a week. Uh, it was calculating by hand or by machine, and it was typing up the reports on typewriters. Ooh, remember typewriters. Uh, they took a crash course in learning engineering, physics, aerodynamics, and uh, that all took place after work hours at a six day work week, uh, Dorothy would actually become besties with two other gals in the early days, and they aren't the ones that are in the movie, <laughs> but Miriam Mann and Catherine Pettigrew were her early besties. Miriam was a very small but feisty gal. Uh, she did not like that there was a cardboard sign in the cafeteria that read colored computers of where they were supposed to sit and eat their lunch. So Miriam just took upon herself to put that sign in her purse. <laughs> Sometimes the sign would come back and Miriam would just take the sign again and put it in her purse until one day that sign just never showed up again. <laughs> Uh, Marjorie Hanna was a white woman and she was the head of the West Area Computers when Dorothy arrived. Marjorie treated the women as equals. 
um, including inviting many of the gals to get togethers at her home. This was rare for the time, and she was sometimes very misunderstood by her coworkers. But after time, uh, the hard work of the gals at the West Area Computers, uh, people shifted their attitudes and they developed a common goal beyond color lines. Now, after the war, after the war had ended, Marjorie uh, left the West Area Computers as the supervisor to join the full scale research division. So her assistant, Blanche Sponsler, also a white woman, moved up to supervisor. Dorothy, our gal Dorothy Vaughn, was named her Blanche's assistant. Okay, so she was the assistant manager. But then it got weird. I mean, it really gets weird. Uh, Blanche, who's now in charge, got sick a lot and would leave Dorothy in charge. Blanche would be gone for like weeks and sometimes months at a time, but she'd always come back. And this apparently happened for years. So in 1949, Blanche came back, but it was clear she was struggling with some kind of mental illness. She was hospitalized and Blanche died a few months later. It took six weeks from Blanche's last day for Dorothy to be unofficially, unofficially named the lead of the West Computing Office. The African-American woman uh, and African-American woman never held a position of authority in NASA in NACA. Uh, so uh, it took her new supervisor, Rufus House, two years to give her the official head title. So in 1951, she got the title. In that time, she did the work of the head of the West Area Computers from 1947 to 1951 without that official title. Uh, once she got the title, it meant that she was the first ever black supervisor at NACA, which would become NASA. It was the highest management position any woman could receive at the time. So it was a big deal. Dorothy's uh, tenure as supervisor, she worked tirelessly to support and promote both black and white women within the laboratory. She worked closely and was well respected with white mathematicians on many different projects. Dorothy was a steadfast advocate for the women of the West Computing. She even intervened on behalf of the white computers in the group as well, who deserved promotions and or pay raises. She was observant of her surroundings. She deciphered what needed to be done, and she saw the capabilities of the women around her who were able to do the work. And because of how good she was at this, Engineers valued her recommendations. They knew that if they asked her who is the best gal for this job, they would get the best gal for this job. And for challenging assignments, they often requested that Dorothy personally handle the assignment or the work herself. Now, when Russia launched Sputnik 1 in 1957, everything changed at NACA. NACA was trying to do the same thing, but they were really failing. Once again, the U.S. president, this time Eisenhower, was very worried about military capabilities. Um, and as the movie Hidden Figures actually sums it up quite nicely, quote, if they can launch a rocket into space, bombs will follow. That was very much the thought process at the time. So nine months after Sputnik, NASA was created, and its mission was to have the U.S. be the leader in the space age. So NACA turns to NASA, and that means a change from a military operation to a civilian operation. So very slowly, segregation ended. Kind of like that cardboard sign that Miriam Mann would just kind of like, you know, put in her purse on lunch day and then not show up sometimes and show up sometimes. Uh, soon there wouldn't be a West Area computers. Took some time, it was very slow, but it would happen. Uh, computers from IBM started arriving at NASA. The first was the 704. It was known as the electronic calculator. Uh, then there was the big dog, 
there was the IBM 790, that one arrived. Dorothy noticed that with these new physical computers, not people, it would be a less need for women as computers, regardless of what color they were. So women like Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson, who we will talk about in a little bit, they did transfer to other departments within NASA, okay? And the computer pool was very deep with talent, and more talent that you had, the less you stayed in the computer pool, the more you moved up into other departments. But many women were still looking for work, and the IBM was starting to take their jobs away. So perhaps for job security, perhaps for a chance to move up within NASA, Dorothy decided to teach herself the computer language Fortran because even though these supercomputers could do great things, people, very few people actually knew how to get them working, how to keep them working, and how to double check them if they're wrong. So she not only learned uh, the computer itself, but she helped write the handbook detailing the equation methods that would be used by the IBMs. Dorothy saw an opportunity for upward movement for women computers, black and white. In 1961, Dorothy unofficially, or sorry, officially, that's the word, officially moved to the Analysis Computation Division, the ACD division. And it was men and women, black and white, working together, programming computers. So Dorothy Vaughn retired from NASA in 1971. At the age of 60, she sought but never received another management position at Langley. But her legacy lives on as one of the most successful careers of the notable West Computing alumni. Uh, she lived to be 98 years old. She died of natural causes on November 10th, 2008. 98. Isn't that amazing? So let's move on to Catherine. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, sorry, my computer's like, oh, uh, maybe. There we go, Catherine. There's Catherine. So let's talk about a hidden figure that is still with us. Catherine Johnson is still with us. Um, uh, Catherine Johnson is 101. Uh, she published her autobiography. Da, 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 da. There is her autobiography, um, which I admit I still need to read it. <laughs> but we got it in actually not too long ago, so I'm super excited. Um, Catherine was born in West Virginia in 1918. She was the youngest of four kids. She was gifted from the start. Uh, however, her school in her area only went up to eighth grade. So normally, a kid is about 13 or 14 years old when they reach eighth grade. Well, Catherine was 10. <laughs> so being way ahead of the kids in her area, Catherine was accepted to the Institute of West Virginia, which was on the campus of West Virginia State College. Just like Dorothy, Catherine was 14 when she graduated high school. In college, she took every single math course she possibly could, and she had many mentors. One of her mentors was Angie King Turner, uh, the first African-American woman to gain a degree in chemistry and mathematics. So this blows my mind. Catherine graduated college with degrees in French and math at the age of 18. Crazy. Uh, love it. With all that education, she became the best, uh, she took the best opportunity she could for her at that time. And the best opportunity was to be a teacher. Uh, she soon met and secretly married James Goebel in 1939. So around this time, schools slowly started integrating. Dr. Davis was the president of the West Virginia State College, and he actually turned down uh, money to fund a graduate program for their all-black segregated school. The reason why he turned down money was the hopes that West Virginia University would be compelled to accept black students. And he was right. So the West Virginia's governors decided not to fight. 
but to let inter uh, to let integration process move forward. The governor asked Dr. Davis to handpick three African American students to integrate. And when Dr. Davis explained this to Catherine, he said, I pick you. Yeah. So Catherine quit her job and enrolled in school once again. Uh, after only a year of attending graduate school, uh, she became pregnant and it became time to tell the world about her marriage and leave school. Catherine did not regret her decision to be at home and take care of her family. Um, she often considered herself to be very lucky. Once her children, uh, she would have three daughters, by the way, grew older, Catherine went back to teaching math and French. Catherine heard about NACA, her uh, hiring black mathematicians from her brother-in-law. Uh, they were at a wedding in Virginia. Uh, it was a math job that she had been waiting for and applied right away. She started in 1953 and she reported to our Dorothy Vaughn in the West Area Computers. But she didn't stay there for that long. For two weeks she was there. And then a request came in from the Flight Research Division that they were looking for two new computers. So Dorothy sent Irma Taines and Katherine Johnson. Sorry, it was Katherine Goebel at the time. There we go. Uh, in Margot's book, Hidden Figure, she talks about Catherine's very first encounter with the engineers and how it uh, really didn't go that great. Uh, Catherine took really busy stock of the room, the chaoticness of the room. It was mostly male, but not all. And she just kind of headed for an empty cube of tables, kind of by the engineers, and she put her stuff down. Uh, she smiled, and then one of the engineers stood up and walked away. And Margot wrote in the book, quote, Bemused, Catherine considered the engineer's sudden departure. The moment that passed between them could have been because she was black and he was white, but then again, it could have been because she was a woman and he was a man, or maybe in that moment, the interaction was between a professional and a sub-professional, an engineer and a girl. Could have been some of it, could have been all of it, right? So uh, that engineer who disappeared, uh, once he found out that she was also from West Virginia, the two actually became very fast friends. <laughs> so Catherine stayed in flight and research for a while, so much so that Dorothy noticed that Catherine, uh, who should be getting her six month promotion, might not because she wasn't back in the computer pool. Uh, Dorothy had a meeting with Henry Pearson, who was the branch chief of flight and research, and said, quote, either give her a raise or send her back to me. <laughs> Pearson offered, a, offered Catherine a permanent position with a raise. There was no way that he was going to send Catherine back. Uh, Catherine asked the right questions and her work was flawless. Catherine loved what she was doing. Her first assignment involved figuring out what the cause of a crash of a propeller plane that happened on the base. Her calculations involved analytic geometry with lots of variables. The engineers were able to take her data and test it and find out the problem that happened and how to solve it moving forward. She loved that what she was able to do with math had such a positive outcome for the future. So the Mercury program. The Mercury program was the mission to put Americans into space. And the real goal was to have a man in orbit and return him safely before the Russians. That was the big part, before the Russians. Uh, but the truth was the Russians were way ahead of the US, um, hence the space race, right? So Catherine at this time was in the space task group and it was comprised of many of the engineers from flight and research. Catherine did the trajectory analysis for Alan Shepard's May 1961 Freedom 7 mission, which was America's first space flight. A year later, when John Glenn was about to embark on his first orbital mission, the IBM computers were being utilized more and more, and there was more working parts that needed to be precise. Now, the IBMs were tracking stations in Washington, D.C., 
Cape Canaveral, and Bermuda. There was three different ones and they all needed to have the same numbers. That was their way of their triple check. But during a pre-flight check, NASA said there was a hiccup. That's the technical term, hiccup. So when John Glenn was told that there was a hiccup, he told the engineers to go get the girl. And that meant Catherine. Uh, John Glenn said this, if she says they're good, then I'm ready to go. So she checked the same numbers that the IBMs had processed by hand and approved them. And John Glenn's flight was a success. So Catherine helped calculate the trajectory for the 1969 Apollo 11 flight to the moon. Uh, during that landing, she was at a meeting in the Pocono Mountains. So she and a few others crowded around a small television set watching those very first steps on the moon. Catherine also worked on the Apollo 13 moon mission. When the spacecraft began to fail, and the mission was aborted, her work was on the backup procedures and charts to help set a safe path for the crew's return to Earth. She helped create a one-star observation system that will allow the astronauts to determine their location with accuracy. With all of the scattered debris from the explosion, it was hard to tell the difference between a star and the debris. So Jim Lovell adapted the practice procedures that Catherine had proposed of you and then uh, utilize that with using the horizon line as a fixed point for navigation. In a 2010 interview with Catherine, she said, quote, everybody was concerned about getting them there, getting the astronauts there. She says, quote, we were concerned about getting them back. That was her main concern. In Catherine's personal life, she did lose her first husband to a brain tumor. She promised him that their children's education and ambition would be her biggest priority. It would be four years later that she would marry James Johnson. He was a second lieutenant in the army and a veteran of the Korean War. The two met at church. He understood that Catherine's job was long hours and highly confidential information. Catherine retired from NASA in 1986. She worked at Langley for 33 years. She said in an interview, I loved going to work every single day. Now, Catherine is the most awarded of the hidden figures. It might be because she has lived the longest. I know I said this, that she is still alive. I forgot she actually died earlier this February. I apologize for that. Um, many, many times I have given this talk and she has still been alive. So this is actually the first time that I've given this talk and talked about her and she is no longer with us. She lived to be 101, I think. Was it 101 or was it 102? I'm trying to think. I'm um, looking at the thing. 102. 102. Um, so, but she is the most awarded. Um, so it might be because she, she lived the longest or the most recent, and of course because of the movie and the book, but it's also because her fingerprints are more directly on many NASA missions that were high profile. But regardless, she is a national treasure, and she's just freaking adorable. Um, when she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, from President Barack Obama, he gave her a little kiss on the cheek, and it made her whole day, like you can see in her face, she's just swooning. It's so, so cute. Um, so Catherine was named West Virginia State's College Outstanding Alumnus in 1999. In 2016, Catherine was included in 100 Women, BBC's list of 100 influential women worldwide, and NASA stated, quote, her calculations proved as critical to the success of the Apollo moon landing and the start of the space shuttle program as they did to those first steps on the country's journey into space. That's pretty good. On May 5th, 2016, a new large building named the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility was formally, formally uh, dedicated at the agency at Langley's Research Division in Virginia. The facility opened its doors in 2017. Katherine attended the event, which marked the 55th anniversary of astronaut Ellen Shepard's historic rocket launch and splashdown. It was a wonderful success that Johnson helped 
them achieve. So during that event, Catherine also received a Silver Snoopy Award. Uh, it's often called an Astronauts Award. NASA stated that it is given to those who, quote, have made an outstanding contribution to the flight safety and mission success. Um, and uh, earlier last year, it was announced that Congress, uh, Congressional Gold Medal would be awarded to Katherine Johnson and Christine Darden, and posthumously to Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson would receive one as well. So let's move on to Mary Jackson. Mary Jackson, she becomes one of my favorites really, really fast. I just, oh my gosh. Uh, She's my favorite, it's hard to hide. Um, I really shouldn't have a favorite, but she is the one that I personally connect with most and not the one that I thought I was going to actually connect with. Uh, but let me tell you her story. <laughs> and, and we'll see if you do as well. Um, now, Mary Jackson is played by Janella Monet in the movie. And Mary was the first black engineer at NASA. Also, because of her, she created more opportunities for women at NASA. She was born in 1921 and grew up in Virginia. She graduated high school um, with high honors and served as the president of the school's first National Honor Society chapter. She went to college and got a bachelor's degree in physical sciences and mathematics. After she graduated, she taught math for a year in Maryland before coming back to Virginia because her father was sick. She took a job at the USO on Langley's Air Force Base, you know, that headquarters of where Langley and the NASA Research Division is going to be. Um, so Mary was hired as a USO officer to organize financial accounts and she also organized the, the front desk, the front desk. Uh, she led dances <laughs> and she also led a Girl Scout troop uh, as part of the USO. She was known as the gal who gets things done with wonderful energy. Can you see how I'm sorry? Anyway, uh, her sharing is caring spirit was admired by a Levi Jackson. And after a fine romance, they married in 1944. When the war ended, King Street USO was closed. They were only open during wartime. And so Mary started looking for a new job. She worked as a bookkeeper for the Hampton Institute of Health Service, but she left when her son was born. She became a stay-at-home mom and a leader of the Bethel AME's Girl Scout Troop number 11. <laughs> so in the book, Hidden Figures, uh, Margot Lee Shetterly writes about this about Mary, quote, Mary became a combination of a teacher, a big sister, a fairy godmother, helping girls with their algebra homework, sewing dresses for their prom, and steering them towards college. Uh, when Mary's son turned four, she applied for two jobs at Langley. One was a clerical position, and another one was at a computer. She got the clerical job first, but three months later, she was hired as a computer. So in 1951, Mary Jackson began working at NACA. She started as a computer or as a research mathematician in the all-black West computing section of Langley. Mary reported to her new supervisor, Dorothy Vaughn, who actually had supervisor title at that time. So after two years at the West computing pool, Dorothy sent Mary to the east side. All right, so unlike the movie, Hidden Figures, it was actually Mary who struggled with the segregated bathrooms. Finding her way around the east side, when nature called, she asked the white women in the hallway to direct her to the bathroom, and they laughed at her. Margot writes in the book, quote, how would they know how to find her bathroom? At the end of the day, she was so upset and humiliated as she ran into Kazmarek Karznanek. They call him Kaz. They both were letting off steam of the day's frustrations when Kaz said, why don't you come work for me? So in 1953, she accepted an offer to work with the engineer Kaz in the supersonic pressure tunnel. The wind tunnel was used to study forces on a model by generating a whole bunch of winds twice the speed of sound. 
Kaz encouraged Mary to undergo training so that she could be promoted as an engineer. Her goal was to understand airflow, to include thrust and drag forces to improve the planes. Now, my favorite moment in the movie Hidden Figures is between Mary's character and Carl's character. For some odd reason, they didn't call him Kaz, but he's, he's kind of like, you know, amalgamation. He's a tribute to Kaz, the real life person. Uh, but Carl's character in the movie says, quote, let me ask you, if you were a white male, would you wish to be an engineer? And Mary's character said, I wouldn't have to. I'd already be one. It's my favorite line in the movie. So four years before earning the title of engineer, there was a landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Education, and that banned all segregation in public schools in the United States. Mary's home state of Virginia was slow on this inclusion. So even though it was a, the law of the land, Virginia was slow. When it came to schools that NACA used for employees extended education, there was training and school programs that welcomed black NACA employees, uh, and that was the Hampton, Hampton Institute. It's also the George Washington University classes at the Hampton Institute, the College of William and Mary, and Newport News High School had night classes. But Hampton High School, offered the University of Virginia's extension classes and was a major staple of what the NACA program used. But the University of Virginia did not allow black students. Mary had to petition the city of Hampton for special permission to attend whites only school. She faced the school board and she was given a permit for just her, just her to attend. She assumed that the white school was some kind of wonderland uh, with state-of-the-art facilities, but instead she entered a rundown old building and it was a shock to her. It was that realization that the grass isn't actually always greener on the other side, that racial prejudice was just absurd, absolutely absurd. She's like, they're keeping this from us? Mary finished her classes. She became an engineer in training and she got her official engineering title in 1958. During the Apollo phases of NASA, Mary was in the four foot supersonic pressure testing tunnel and they were making sure that they were ready for supersonic speeds. Her focus was on how the bolts and rivets and grooves in an aircraft would affect airspeed, drag, and turbulence. She authored 12 different papers on the subject. Uh, this is a picture of her. There she is. At the end, I put a giant arrow on it. Uh, there is her and her fellow employees at the 4x4 tunnel. So in the 1970s, Langley announced that it was laying off people and it was going to cancel the supersonic transport program. Uh, there was a war in Vietnam at this time. There was social unrest in the streets, but Mary stayed on in the tunnels, even though the name started changing. Uh, Mary even took a Fortran cl class, just like Dorothy did, because she was worried that the computer software would replace her wind tunnels, just like it was replacing the computer pool. So Mary's work in the four-foot tunnel was, was changing. In 1977, the wind tunnel changed to nitrogen, and Kaz retired. Mary kind of took stock of her life. She was 58 and she was at the top of where a female engineer could achieve within the company. So she took a new position. She took a position in the federal women's program uh, as a manager, which was a demotion for her uh, from her current level, but it would allow her to advance all women at the center and bring more women into NASA. It was not an easy decision to take a demotion. Margot writes in the book, quote, accepting the position at the Federal Women's Program Manager was a way of uniting 28 years of work with Langley with a lifetime commitment to equality for all. So Mary would work on a program 
that was about training to become an equality opportunity specialist and an affirmative action program specialist. She highlighted and created opportunities for women and minorities. She helped a lot of people reach for the stars. Mary would retire from NASA in 1985. She continued volunteering and she took a new role as being a grandma. <laughs> Mary passed on peacefully in 2005. She was 83 years old. Her friend and co-worker Gloria Champagne said in her eulogy of Mary, quote, she was a role model of the highest character. So that is, um, that is the three ladies. And I always think about overarching lessons, things that you can kind of take um, from these three gals. And I, I will tell you mine, and I will love to hear yours when we open it up for, for comments and discussions. Um, but here's kind of my overarching lesson that I will leave you with. Uh, NASA was built on the idea of gathering the most brilliant minds of our time. And many of them were immigrants, and many of them were women. War was the biggest factor in the creation of NACA and then the creation of NASA, fear and war. Uh, it's also what kept it funded. Fear and war is what kept it funded. Now, we all know the image of Rosie the Riveter. If you haven't, I'll put it on the screen. So of Rosie the Riveter, she represents how women went to work during World War II, right? The we can do it scenario. Well, I see the gals of hidden figures, the ones we talked about and the ones that we didn't, as an extension of that Rosie the Riveter icon. The hidden figures were doing their part during the wartime for patriotism. And it's a cool thing that these gals got to stay. The hidden figures gals got to stay in their jobs. Where the Rosies, a lot of them went back home. And the hidden figures, they were black. They had less of an opportunity, and this was a major opportunity. The visual imagery is crucial because you see the Rosie the Riveter, and hopefully you know what that stands for. But if you are a person of color, you might not see yourself in that. You might not see your family heritage. And so that hole needs to be filled because representation absolutely matters. And the credit goes to Margot Lee Shatterley for the book of Hidden Figures to uncovering these women and bringing them into the spotlight, giving us that visual Dorothy, Catherine, and Mary, giving us those three brilliant minds that were brilliant in different ways who did their part for their country and moved those color lines back, just a little further back. So to me, they are an extension of Rosie, but they're also an evolution to something even greater. Because these three gals, everybody should know about and they should find inspiration about because they're a complete package. Their backstory is amazing, their courage is amazing, and their integrity is absolutely amazing.